All right, do you want to start now? Yeah, so we'll just get started. So, hi guys, my name's Samantha. Um, I work part-time in the NHS as a specialty doctor in sexual health, and I spend the rest of my time um, lecturing, editing, generally educating. Um, so if you've not been to one of these um, lectures before, the lecture format is primarily SBAs or single best answers. And these are all things gynecology that are likely to come up in your finals. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll pop up a question, we'll allow you one minute to read the question and to submit an answer, and then we'll go through the question together at the end, just so that you're confident that you know what the correct answer is and how we came to that. Now, I'm going to stop my video just because I do find my connections better without the video, but rest assured I am here. Okay. And if you have any questions and answers, um, pop them in the Q&A box. Any technical problems, pop them in the chat box and we'll try and get things sorted for you. So the plan today, we're going to go through all things menstruation. We're going to have a bit of a chat about contraception talk about hormone replacement therapy, Fraser guidelines, and we'll end the session with an emergency scenario from a real life scenario. So let's just recap some basic definitions when we're talking about menstrual things. So menstruation, that obviously means your menstrual period, the bleeding part. Amenorrhea, that means when there's no periods and no bleeding. Menorrhagia, that's excessive bleeding. Dysmenorrhea, that is painful bleeding. And irregular menstrual bleeding, that includes things like irregular cycles, intermenstrual bleeding, and postcoital bleeding, that means bleeding during or after sex. So just a reminder of a few key definitions. So let's dive in with the first question, which is related to amenorrhea. And I'll give you one minute to read the question and submit an answer via the poll that's about to pop up. I think there is some issues with audio. Um, I'm certainly not on mute. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything we can do to, to resolve that. I think some people can hear me. Um, if not, do remember this lecture is recorded and that will include the audio, obviously. So if, you, if you're not able to hear the lecture, um, feel free to read it, listen to it back on YouTube. Um, so let's let's recap menarche. So menarche is the occurrence of the first menstrual period, and it usually occurs about the age of 12 to 13 in girls in the UK. However, normal menarche actually can occur up to from age eight all the way up to age 15. So before we talk about early and late menarche, let's talk some more definitions. Let's think about puberty. So puberty is the development of secondary sexual characteristics. So these are things like breast development, pubic hair, axillary hair and widening of the hips. And this occurs in response to a pulsatile secretion of luteinizing hormone LH from the anterior pituitary. Now it usually occurs in a specific order. We usually have breast budding and breast development first. We then have the development of pubic and axillary hair. And we then have menarche, the start of the periods. And the periods usually come about two years after the first sign of breast budding. Precocious puberty, we would call that as development of any of these secondary sexual characteristics before the age of eight or the start of the periods before the age of 10. Delayed puberty, that's the absence of menarche and sexual sec secondary characteristics by the age of 14. And primary amenorrhea, that means that the 
in the absence of menstruation with normal secondary sexual characteristics by the age of 16. And primary amenorrhea means that they have never had a period. So checking back with the answer there, the correct answer there is constitutional delay. So we would call this delayed puberty. This girl is 16 and she's not yet developed any secondary sexual characteristics. She's not really got any signs of puberty yet. So what we call this is delayed puberty. Now, the most common reason behind delayed puberty is constitutional delay. These cases normally have a family history of delayed puberty, so it's useful to ask, you know, when did mum get her periods? When did any sisters or aunts get their periods? Um, looking at the other answers there, B, Turner syndrome. Now, while Turner syndrome is a cause for delayed puberty and primary amenorrhea, it's got quite obvious phenotypical characteristics. We're thinking things like a short web neck, a broad chest, a wide carrying angle. This girl appears normal, so it's unlikely that she has, that has Turner syndrome. Imperforate hymen, but that means that the hymen, the portion of skin just over the entrance to the vagina, doesn't have a hole in it. So essentially, the periods happen, but the blood doesn't get out. Now, teenagers often have evident, teenagers with an imperforate hymen would have normal secondary sexual characteristics. So they'd have things like breast development, they would have things like uh, pubic hair, but they wouldn't have actual bleeding. And often these girls will have cyclical pelvic pain because they are still having a period, the blood is just not getting out of the vagina. And a simple pelvic examination would be able to rule this out. Mayor rokotansky houster house syndrome, I've never seen anyone with that. That is a rare congenital condition where the patient has a blind ending or absent vagina. Now, these patients normal, normally have normal secondary sexual characteristics, but they have primary amenorrhea because they simply don't have, don't have properly formed sexual organs. And E, pregnancy. Now, we should never forget to ask about pregnancy in all cases of amenorrhea, even primary amenorrhea. But the scenario does say that this girl isn't sexually active, so we can rule out pregnancy in this case. So the correct answer there is constitutional delay. So let's move on to the next question. And again, you'll have a minute to read the question and formulate an answer. Perfect, thank you for answering. So most of you got the correct answer there. So this woman's got menorrhagia, doesn't she? She's got excessive heavy menstrual bleeding. And menorrhagia is any excessive or heavy menstrual blood loss, which interferes with the quality of life. So actually, um, there's no, there's no specific volume that is determined here. So for obvious reasons, it's quite hard to measure menstrual blood loss. The NICE guidelines suggest that excessive blood loss is 80 mils or more, or bleeding for a duration of more than seven days. Um, for context, the normal blood loss during a menstrual period is about 30 to 40 mils, and about 90% of people have losses less than 80 mils. But excessive menstrual bleeding is also defined as a need to change menstrual products every one to two hours, passage of clots greater than two and a half centimetres, or any very heavy periods reported by the woman. So when we're taking a history of someone with heavy bleeding, we want to think about how many pads are they using? Are they passing clots? And how is it affecting the woman's quality of life? And the most important thing to remember is that when a woman reports very heavy periods, there's actually no need for her to be asked to enter how many mills she's losing each period. If she thinks it's heavy, it's heavy and it's menorrhagia. So let's talk about causes of menorrhagia. So in up to half of cases, there is no specific cause. It is just a heavy period and there's nothing that we can point our finger at. 
But we can divide other causes into uterine and ovarian, systemic and iatrogenic. So thinking about uterine and ovarian things, that includes things like fibroids, endometriosis, infections, polyps, hyperplasia and polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. Systemic pathologies, now these are things that mess with coagulation, so things like coagulation disorders, hypothyroidism, metabolic disorders, so diabetes, hyperprotonemia, and systemic diseases such as liver and renal disease can also mess with coagulation. And menorrhagia can also be caused by us. So is the patient on a medication that predisposes them to bleeding? Are they taking some herbal supplement that interferes with blood clotting? Do they have a copper coil in situ? All of these things can cause heavy periods. Let's just have a quick chat about uterine fibroids in particular, as these are one of the most common causes of menorrhagia. So remember, fibroids are benign tumours of smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts, fibroblasts, and these form a solid lump in the myometrium, so in the uterus. They can vary in number, you can have one fibroid or multiple fibroids, and they can vary vastly in size. So you can have tiny fibroids, just one millimetre, up to huge fibroids filling the entire pelvis over 30 centimetres. Risk factors for developing fibroids include increased age, having an early puberty, obesity, ethnicity and a family history and fibroids are actually usually asymptomatic and quite often people don't know that they have them. Other symptoms apart from menorrhagia can include pelvic pain, dysmenorrhea, so remember that's painful periods and if they're particularly large they can impinge on the bladder and the bowel causing bladder and bowel symptoms. So checking back with the question here, the woman is of older age, she's overweight, so she does have risk factors for fibroids. And on examination, we can feel her uterus above her pubic symphysis. So she does have a palpable uterus. So the most likely diagnosis here is fibroids. Checking in with the other answers there, A, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So that is a diagnosis of exclusion in women experiencing irregular or heavy bleeding. And whilst about half of cases are due to dysfunctional uterine bleeding. This palpable uterus makes that makes fibroids the top diagnosis. Checking with the other, other options there, it's unlikely to be pregnancy. She's got a four month history of heavy blood loss, but we do always think about risk of pregnancy. Now it's less likely to be endometriosis as endometriosis doesn't typically cause a palpable uterus. And the primary symptom in endometriosis is usually pain rather than heavy bleeding, although you certainly can have heavy bleeding along with endometriosis. Anterical cancer, that can present with heavy bleeding, but often the bleeding is unrelated to the menstrual cycle. And again, this wouldn't be causing a palpable uterus unless it was very advanced. So fibroids here is our top diagnosis. Let's think about how we diagnose and manage these. So uterine fibroids, the diagnosis is usually confirmed with an ultrasound scan. This could be transabdominal or transvaginal. And this is, can be arranged routinely if you're pretty confident that it's, that it's fibroids and there's no worrying features. So there's no ascites, weight loss, irregular bleeding. We can usually arrange that as a routine ultrasound scan. Obviously, if there was any red flag symptoms, so ascites, weight loss, irregular bleeding, we'd want to think about ordering that as an urgent scan because we're thinking more about cancers. In terms of management, the first line and most effective management of small fibroids is with an interuterine contraceptive system, so an IUS, for example, the marina coil. So this wee coil secretes levonorgestrel into the uterus. It can improve symptoms and it can actually shrink those fibroids. Other, other treatments, we can think about tranexamic acid. Now that's usually taken on the first day of bleeding for four to five days. And the aim of that is to reduce blood loss. And several contraceptives can be used in the management of fibroids, so the combined pill or a progestogen-only pill. And again, the aim of those is to reduce bleeding and to help with symptoms. And if all else has failed, we can think about surgery. So we can have a uterine artery embolization where they physically embolize the uterine arteries, so there's no longer so much blood flow going to the endometrium. We can do a myomectomy, so that is physically chopping out the fibroids. Or in severe cases, we can do a full hysterectomy, so chopping out the whole uterus. In many cases, fibroids are asymptomatic, and if they're not causing any bother, or if their symptoms are manageable, we don't need to do any specific treatment. So let's move on to the next question. Again, one minute to read the question and pop in an answer in the poll.
lovely. Thank you for contributing. So very varied answers there. So we're not sure what the correct answer is there. So this woman's having irregular menstrual bleeding, isn't she? She's 50 years old and she's having four months of irregular bleeding. She's got no other symptoms. She's got no perimenopausal symptoms. She's not sexually active and she's got no regular medications. Now, irregular menstrual bleeding is common around menopause. And it's also common kind of after you've just started your periods. However, new irregular bleeding in someone that's been having regular periods should always be investigated. And that is to exclude things like cancers. So causes of irregular bleeding, um, infection, if they're taking hormonal contraception, particularly progestogen only contraception, that's known for causing irregular bleeding. Pregnancy, people can bleed throughout pregnancy and cannot know that they're pregnant for many months. Weight changes can cause irregular bleeding, particularly weight loss. So you can quite often see irregular bleeding in a lady that's lost a lot of weight recently or has upped her exercise a lot recently. PCOS is known to cause irregular bleeding. And endometrial pathology, so endometrial hyperplasia, that's where the endometrium is, is growing too much and is bleeding randomly. And obviously the thing we want to rule out is cancer. So we're thinking cancers of the cervix, cancers of the uterus. So looking back at the question here, the most appropriate first step for her is to arrange a transvaginal ultrasound scan. So it's mindful to think that her symptoms might well be just because she's approaching the menopause, she's 50. It would be worth taking a thorough history, focusing on what she means by irregular bleeding. So a lengthening of cycles is quite common as a, as a woman approaches the menopause. However, sporadic bleeding between periods is more of a cause for concern. And the worry here is an endometrial cancer, which typically presents in women at around the age of 50, and it typically presents with irregular bleeding. Now, a transvaginal ultrasound scan would allow for visualisation of the endometrium, and the person doing the scan will measure the endometrial thickness. And that's a good indication of is the endometrium behaving itself, or does it look like it's thickened? Does it look like there's a growth there that might be a cancer? So the correct answer there is to arrange for a transvaginal ultrasound scan. Checking in with the other answers there, air refer for colposcopy. So remember colposcopy is where, where you would use a speculum and a camera to view the cervix. Um, this would be indicated if the patient had an abnormal smear test, and that's to look for cervical cancer as a cause for her regular bleeding. Again, we want to take a thorough history, check if this patient has attended for her smear tests and if there's any other risk factors for cervical cancer. And obviously in this situation, we may also perform a speculum examination to physically look at her cervix. And if her cervix looked grossly abnormal, of course, we would refer for colposcopy, but that's not mentioned in this scenario. Thinking about starting the combined oral contraceptive pill. Um, yep, that's a good option for regulating bleeding in younger women. However, this combined oral contraceptive pill is not recommended in women over the age of 50. And obviously she does have new irregular bleeding. Rather than just ignoring this new irregular bleeding and trying to control it with a pill, we do need to investigate this. D, uh, Marina Coil. So yep, a Marina Coil does reduce blood loss. And in about 10 to 30% of women, it stops their periods altogether. So it induces amenorrhea. So it is a good option for her if she wants to not have irregular bleeding, if she wants to perhaps stop her periods. But again, we do need to rule out endometrial pathology first. Also worth bearing in mind, the marina coil uh, can cause irregular bleeding. So if we put in a coil, we have no idea if we have cured the irregular bleeding or caused more irregular bleeding. So that is not want, what we want to be doing with this lady. And tranexamic acid, remember that is a treatment for menorrhagia or dysmenorrhea, so heavy or painful periods. That's not what this woman is presenting with. That's not an appropriate treatment. So the correct answer there is a range of a transvaginal ultrasound scan. So moving on to the next question, again, have a minute to pop an answer in the poll.
Perfect. Thank you for contributing. Most people are going with A there, perform a speculum examination. So this young lady has postcoital bleeding, doesn't she? She's having four episodes of, of bleeding following sexual intercourse. Uh, she's got a regular cycle, she's got her marina in, and she describes this bleeding as painless, and she doesn't have any other kind of symptoms. So um, causes of postcoital bleeding, we're thinking things like infections, we're thinking things like cervical ectropion, we're thinking of polyps, cancers, and other vulval pathology. So um, atrophic vaginitis caused by the menopause, lichen planus, that is a, a dermatological condition that can cause bleeding. And since she's got that marina coil in place, we do want to think about coil displacement as a cause of postcoital bleeding. So checking back with the answer there, the correct answer, as most people put, was perform a speculum examination. So the most important thing to do is examine this patient. We want to look at her vulva, look at her vagina, and we want to visualize the cervix. And while performing this examination, we can also take vaginal swabs, which is answer B. So we can actually do those swabs when we're doing the speculum examination. And we can also check her coil strings as well while we're there. So in terms of coil displacement, if the strings have become longer, if the, if the strings have become shorter, or if you can actually see part of the coil poking out of the cervix, those are all signs of coil displacement. So the most likely cause of her um, postcoital bleeding is probably an ectropion. So let me talk a bit about a cervical ectropion. So Cervical ectropion is where the columnar epithelium, which normally is inside the cervix, pops out at the cervical os. And it appears as a sort of bright red halo just around the os, and it might bleed on contact. So you'll see this quite easily with a speculum. And when you're taking your swabs, if you gently touch that area, you might find that it bleeds on contact. So this is a benign condition. We don't need to do anything about this. However, it's important to educate the person and tell them what this is, what this means, and what they need to do if anything changes. So in, in some cases where the bleeding is particularly problematic, we can laser that area and remove those columnar cells. But normally it doesn't cause too much bother and it is considered a normal finding. And it's more common in younger people and it's more common in people who are using hormonal contraception. So let's move on to the next question. Again, you'll have a minute to read the question and pop an answer in the poll. Perfect, thank you for answering there. So this young 16 year old, she has painful periods, so dysmenorrhea. So the most common, these are the most common at the extremes of menstruation. So at the start of your periods when you're young and at the end of your periods when you're approaching the menopause. And um, we can divide this into primary dysmenorrhea, which is painful periods with, with no organic cause and secondary dysmenorrhea, which is painful periods where there is an underlying cause. So what are those underlying causes? So underlying causes, we want to rule out things like endometriosis, infection, pelvic adhesions, fibroids, and congenital abnormalities of the genital tract. In terms of management, so management aims to relieve troublesome symptoms. So non-pharmacological methods are great. So heat packs, warm baths, gentle exercise, use of a TENS machine, those are often overlooked in the management of dysmenorrhea, but most people that have periods in this group, I'm sure you've had nights with a heat pack and a warm bath because you've had period pain. They're, they're a great method of management. Obviously, analgesia, we would start with things like paracetamol, ibuprofen, perhaps cocodamol. 
but the most most useful painkiller is methanamic acid which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and it is particularly good at treating menstrual pain so it's better has better evidence than things like ibuprofen so for this girl that's already taking paracetamol and ibuprofen i'd want to think about switching that ibuprofen to methanamic acid just because it's got a much better evidence profile at treating period pains Oral contraceptives, yep, we might want to consider starting an oral contraceptive because this can reduce menstrual blood loss. It can reduce period pains. I think this woman in the scenario said that she didn't want to consider anything containing hormones. So we'd want to stay away from the combined oral contraceptive pill for her because she doesn't want to have any hormones. For the same reason, I would want to talk about a marina coil. At 16, she might not even have heard of a marina coil because they are absolutely fantastic at reducing menstrual blood loss and reducing painful periods. And if all of these measures don't work, we would think about referring the patient for a diagnostic laparoscopy. So keyhole camera into the belly to see if we can look for things like endometriosis, adhesions and abnormalities. So the correct answer here was um, switching to methanamic acid. Why would we not do A, inserting a copper coil? So copper coils are known to have a side effect of it. they can cause heavier and more painful periods. So we would want to avoid a copper coil in this patient. Combined pill, we want to avoid that because she doesn't want to take anything containing hormones. However, would be worth a chat for this girl. She might have preconceptions about hormonal contraceptives. Codeine phosphate, that's going up your pain ladder. I would probably want to start by um, switching her ibuprofen to methanamic acid first before we think about starting opiates. And diazepam, that's an anti-anxiety medication that is not appropriate for, for treating menstrual pains. So let's move on to the next question. Again, you'll have a minute. Perfect, thank you for answering. So here we've got a patient with premenstrual syndrome, don't we, PMS. So premenstrual syndrome, that is defined as distressing psychological, physical or behavioural symptoms that occur during the luteal phase. So remember the luteal phase, that is the phase straight after ovulation. Now, the exact cause of PMS is unclear, but it appears to be triggered by ovulation. And that basically induces many changes in the body's hormonal systems, responses to hormones and other chemical messengers such as serotonin. So therefore, the management of PMS is to reduce or suppress ovulation to remove that trigger of ovulation. And this is safely achieved, usually by using the combined oral contraceptive pill. And we would use that with no pill-free interval, because using it continuously with no pill-free interval is the most reliable way of suppressing ovulation. Other treatments, we can use transdermal oestrogen. Um, but we do need to remember that we need to use a progesterone alongside that. So we never prescribe unopposed oestrogen in someone with a uterus. The reason being is that oestrogen will cause the endometrium to proliferate, which can cause hyperplasia and it can predispose to cancer. So if you are thinking about oestrogen patches, remember we always need to give a progesterone to prevent that. And GnRH analogs, so things like triptorelin, and um, these are sort of a, used less frequently. Uh, these can have significant effects on bone mineral density, so we'd avoid those particularly in younger people. And other non-hormonal methods, things like antidepressants, so SN SSRIs, SNRIs, tricyclics can all be effective at treating PMS. So let's move on to the next question. Again, you will have a minute. Uh, sorry. You, sorry, I'll just I'll go through the correct answers there first. So the correct answer there, which most of you got, was combined oral contraceptive pill. 
Um, why wouldn't we use transdermal estrogen? Yet we can use that, but it's not a first line treatment for PMS. Thinking about a hormonal intrauterine system, so that's your marina coils. We don't tend to use that for PMS as the hormone only acts locally. It doesn't affect estrogen levels and it's not 100% reliable in stopping ovulation. Depo Provera, we don't tend to use that for PMS. Actually, one of the side effects of that is that it can cause mood swings. We probably want to stay away from that. And triptoreal, and that's one of those GnRH um, analogs which acts to suppress ovarian steroid production, essentially. As I said, these have a detrimental effect on bone mineral density. So we tend to use those as a kind of second, third line um, treatment of PMS. So let us move on to the next question. So again, you'll have a minute. Perfect. Thank you for answering there. So people are going for um, either A or B in that answer. So let's talk about HRT. So hormone replacement therapy. Now HRT is a, as a topic is pretty complex and there's over 50 different regimes available out there. So I'm not going to go into all that. But broadly, HRT is offered to women suffering from menopausal symptoms. So these symptoms are all caused by the relative lack of estrogen as the ovaries stop producing as much estrogen. So symptoms like hot flushes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, reduced libido, um, other, other things like reduced concentration, brain fog. These are all symptoms of the menopause and lack of estrogen. Now, HRT usually comprises of both estrogen and progestogen, and this is known as combined HRT. So the estrogen part of that, that's the part that alleviates the symptoms, and the progestogen component is there to prevent that estrogen from causing endometrial hyperplasia. Remember we spoke before, if you just give estrogen, that causes the uterine lining to build up, it can cause hyperplasia, and it can cause, it can predispose to cancers. Do, bearing in mind that if the woman doesn't have a uterus, if she's had a hysterectomy for any reason, we don't need to prescribe the progestogen components. We can prescribe estrogen only in a woman who does not have a uterus. And HRT can be local or systemic. So by local, I mean local estrogen creams. And these are applied to the vulva or the vagina. And these are suitable for people that only have vulval vaginal symptoms. So quite often you'll have people that are only troubled by vaginal dryness, lack of lubrication, and a simple estrogen cream would be suitable for those people. They don't need to have systemic treatment. Um, and these topical therapies, those um, vaginal creams, they do not require a progestogen because they're only acting locally. They're not getting to the uterus and causing that proliferation. Now, the estrogen component that comes as tablets, that comes as, like I said, the vaginal gels, pessaries, creams, and it also comes as transderm transdermal, so patches. And the progestogen component that can be given as a tablet can also come in transdermal form and it can also be administered by an intrauterine device. So we're thinking that hormone coil, that marina coil, that also functions as the progestogen component of HRT with the added advantage that it also provides contraception. So if a woman's in the run up to the menopause, she's thinking about trying hormone replacement therapy, she, a marina coil is a great option because that provides her contraception and it provides her with the progestogen that she needs. Thinking about the regime that we want to use, so we must consider when the woman's last period was. So if she's still having periods or if her last period was fairly recently within the last year, we would normally prescribe HRT in a sequential or cyclical fashion. 
So this, this, in this way, the woman takes an oestrogen every day and a cyclical progesterone to prescribe to provide the endometrial protection. And the progesterone is only taken in the last 14 days of the cycle. So this means that women still have a regular and predictable monthly bleed. And this aims to reduce any breakthrough bleeding, reduce any irregular bleeding that you might get if you give a continuous regime to a woman that has just finished their periods. Continuous HRT, that is suitable for women who are postmenopausal, i.e. women who, where it's been at least a year since their last menstrual period. And continuous regimes, this is a fixed daily dose of both the oestrogen and the progesterone. So checking back with the answer there, most of you put A or B. The correct answer is A, an oral sequential HRT programme. And the reason that we are using a sequential programme is because this woman's last period was only four months ago. The danger is, is if we put her straight onto a continuous programme, she might well suffer from irregular bleeding or breakthrough bleeding. So because she's had a period so recently, we would start her on sequential HRT. We wouldn't obviously give her C, oral oestrogen only. There's no mention of her um, having had a hysterectomy. So we do need to give her progesterone component as well. So C is not appropriate. D, transdermal oestrogen only for exactly the same reasons. We do not give unopposed oestrogen. And a marina into uterine system, that is not going to help her symptoms of her hot flushes. Um, marina gives off progesterone. And like we said, it's the oestrogen that we need to combat those symptoms. So Marina's not going to be of any help with her symptoms. So moving on to the next question. Again, you will have a minute. Perfect, thank you for answering. So let's talk about emergency contraception here. So this 22 year old has had unprotected sex with a male partner and she does not want to be pregnant. So she is someone that requires a discussion about emergency contraception. So emergency contraception should be offered to everyone who has had unprotected sex and they don't wish that to become a pregnancy. So talking about oral emergency contraception, commonly known as the morning after pill, there is two oral pills available in the UK. We have Levonorgestrel, or also known as Levanel, and that is licensed for up to 72 hours, three days following unprotected sex. And we also have Olaprestal Acetate, or ELA-1, and it is licensed for a wee bit longer. It's licensed up to five days following unprotected sex. These both function by delaying ovulation. The thought process there is that if ovulation is delayed until such point where the sperm that has got inside are no longer viable. The copper IUD, that is licensed for up to five days following unprotected sex, and it functions to prevent fertilization and to, to prevent implantation. So for this reason, it can also be used up to five days from the earliest predicted date of ovulation in someone with regular periods. And the way it works is that the copper is toxic to both sperm and egg. So it helps to prevent fertilization if the egg has already come out. And it also creates a hostile endometrium. So even if the egg has been fertilized, it cannot implant into the endometrium and become a pregnancy. And the copper coil has the added benefit of it can provide ongoing contraception. So in this case, the correct answer here is B, a copper intertwined device, copper coil. So she had sex 85 hours ago, so we can discount levonorgestrel because that was only licensed up to 72 hours. Olaprestal acetate, ELA-1, that is an option, but we need to carefully read the wording of the question. So um, it says, what is the most effective contraception? 
So allopristol acetate is about 98, 98% effective at preventing pregnancy. The copper coil is over 99% effective. So for this reason alone, the copper coil is the most effective option and is the correct option in this case. And actually in practice in the sexual health clinic, we always offer a copper, use in copper coil as the first line because it is more effective. And like I said, it has the added advantage of it can stay in situ for three, five, 10 years and provide effective ongoing contraception. So if, if it is someone that is likely to go, a, go on and have other unprotected sex, the copper coil is a great option because it's very effective at preventing pregnancy. Checking with the other answers, uh, marina coil. So while that again provides effective long-acting contraception, it is not suitable for emergency contraception. So it would not be suitable in this case. And methotrexate, methotrexate is normally used for ectopic pregnancy in some circumstances. It is not used for emergency contraception. Um, combined hormonal contraceptive pill, this might be an option for her down the line when she wants to have effective ongoing contraception, but combined hormonal contraceptive pills are not uh, emergency contraception. So the correct answer there is a copper coil. So in any of these questions that come up in your exams that are asking for the most effective emergency contraception, Regardless of the scenario, it is always a copper coil. So let's go on to the next question. Again, you'll have a minute to pop an answer in the poll. Perfect, thank you for answering. So let's talk about combined hormonal contraception or CHC as it's often abbreviated. So the primary way this works is it prevents ovulation, it stops follicles from developing. So traditionally, um, the combined hormonal contraception is, is taken as a pill. It also comes in patch and vaginal rings, which are slightly less popular. So the pill form of combined hormonal contraception is traditionally taken as 21 days of pill taking with a seven day hormone free interval. And during that hormone free interval, that's when bleeding would occur and it's breakthrough bleeding. It's not quite a proper period, but it's very similar to a period. Recent guidance has come out which recommends a more flexible approach to pill taking. So there's many ways that you can now take the pill depending on how, how you want to control your bleeding essentially. So continuous use, this would be where the person takes a pill every single day, they do not take a break. And this might result in breakthrough bleeding, but many women do remain entirely bleed free on this regime for many months. Extended use, that means having less frequent hormone free intervals. So the person can choose to take a break every three months, every four months, every six months. Again, it's giving them a regular and predictable bleed, but they're getting longer periods in between. Shortened hormone free intervals, these are actually now recommended. So we often recommend a four day pill free interval rather than seven days. Uh, this takes away some of the risk of someone starting a new pack late and risking pregnancy. So someone that's taken, a, taken their week's break and then forgets to start their new pack, they put themselves at risk of pregnancy. So having that four days gives us a bit more leeway in terms of being late starting a pack. And flexible extended use, that is where the person would take the pill continuously every day until they have bleeding. So when they do have bleeding, they would take a three or four day pill free break to allow that bleed to occur. These can be quite confusing, so it's important to take the time to explain the regime to your patient, see which one would suit them best. Do they want to have less periods? Do they want to have a guaranteed period every month? So, for example, for, for younger patients where maybe their parents don't know if they're sexually active, they like to have a monthly period 
because that shows their parents that they are having their periods um, and that feels very normal to them. Whereas some people hate to have their periods and would rather have many, many months without a period. So they might choose extended use or flexible extended use. So it's, it's really a conversation with the patient. What's their menstrual pri priorities and what suits them best? So talking about um, hormonal contraception and risk factors and suitability. So basically combined hormonal contraception increases your risk of thromboembolic events. So strokes, DVTs, myocardial infarctions, and any other risk factors on top of that. So things like high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, being obese, being older, having already had a heart attack, having already had a stroke, these all increase your risk as well. So the main point we're thinking of in terms of suitability for combined hormonal contraception is other things that increase your risk of clots. And the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health, they published this list of um, eligibility criteria. It's known as the UK MEC. And you're absolutely not expected to know this as a medical student, but to know it exists is quite useful. You can look it up online. And this helps us make a decision as to whether a particular type of contraception is suitable for our patient. So this exists for all types of contraception, but here we're looking at combined hormonal contraception. So the combined pill, the patch and the vaginal ring. So for combined hormonal contraception, being older, smoking, having vascular disease, being about to undergo major surgery, all of these things mean that you are already at a higher risk of having a clot. So in terms of UK MEC, this is uh, graded one to four, and we're interested in the fours. So the fours mean it is a no-no. Uh, UK MEC four means that the risk of being on the combined hormonal contraception outweighs the benefits, and we should avoid that. So you can see, if you can see those tables, um, having completely uncontrolled blood pressure, having vascular disease, having had a stroke already, those are all absolute no-nos for the combined pill. UK MEC three, um, isn't a complete no-no, but it means that the risks outweigh the benefits. So we would want to think, is there an alternative contraceptive for this person? So patients that are unsuitable for combined hormonal contraception, um, like I've already mentioned, there is age, elevated blood pressure, vascular disease, smoking, things like that. And again, you don't need to know the ins and outs of this. It is all available online. I work in sexual health and I always look this up. But basically, we're thinking about things that increase the risk of clots. So checking back with our question here, the correct answer here um, we, is, is she used to smoke, but she stopped six months ago. So even if you knew nothing about this, you do know that the combined pill increases your risk of clots. So we're thinking here, what, what else is at risk here? So she's she's a bit older, she's 36, um, and she's recently she's recently um stopped smoking. So recently stopped smoking is still a risk. As you know, smoking is a massive risk for blood clots, and stopping smoking doesn't immediately negate all the risks. And combined with her being over 35, her risk is high. Therefore, combined hormonal contraception is too risky. That would be a UK MEC3. And the FSRH says that if you've stopped smoking within the past year, your risk remains high. So for ex-smokers, they must have completely stopped smoking for at least a year to be considered a non-smoker. Having a check at the other answers, so B, uh, being postpartum doesn't preclude you from using hormonal contraception. So we would normally avoid combined hormonal contraception in the first six weeks. But six months is plenty time ago for her clot risk to have reduced. So she would be fine to have the combined pill if she'd had a child six months ago. Being having minor cosmetic surgery. So the surgery things we want to bear in mind is if she's having major surgery, is she going to be immobilized? Is she going to be at risk of a DVT? Having minor cosmetic surgery on her face, that doesn't increase her risk of clot. So she would be fine to have the combined pill there. And if she's been diagnosed with pregnancy-induced hypertension and that has now returned to normal, so she now does not have hypertension. So if she has had hypertension in pregnancy, that would not preclude her from having the combined pill. And E, family history of breast cancer. So a lot of you put this as the correct answer here. So if she has a family history of breast cancer, that does not preclude her from using the combined pill. What would preclude her from using the combined pill is if she had a personal history of breast cancer or if she has a known gene mutation, so she's one of those carriers of, of the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes, then combined hormonal contraception would be contraindicated. Just having a family history is not a contraindication for combined hormonal contraception. 
Some patients do prefer to stay away from hormone things if they've got a family history, but breast cancer is so common that sporadic cases occur quite commonly and they're not all due to familial and gene, gene mutations and things like that. So whilst we would think about discussing it, we, it would not be a contraindication. So let's move on to the next question. We're almost there, guys. And again, you'll have a minute to read the question and pop a wee answer in. Lovely, thank you for answering. So this case relates to the Fraser guidelines, doesn't it? And these are a set of criteria that must be met for us as clinicians to give advice to a child under the age of 16 regarding contraception and sexual health without breaking confidentiality. And there's a set of these um, Number one, they must have sufficient maturity to understand the nature and the implications of the treatment. So you'd be thinking about discussing contraception. Do they know about sex? Do they know about pregnancy? Are they mature enough to make that decision autonomously? Number two, they cannot pers be persuaded to tell their parents or to allow the doctor to tell them. And by parents, I mean guardians, um, foster parents, anyone like that. So ideally, you want people under the age of 16 to have an adult, a responsible person that knows they're having sex, that can support them, can help them with that. Um, number three, they're very likely to begin or continue having sex anyway, regardless of what you do. So are they going to go and have sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend, regardless of what you give to them or tell them? Uh, number four, they're likely to suffer their physical or mental health unless you give them the advice or treatment. And number five, of course, the advice or treatment must be in their best interests. So the correct answer here was C, the girl is likely to have unprotected intercourse whether or not contraception is provided. The girl doesn't need to already be sexually active to request contraceptive advice. However, you must be confident as a healthcare professional that she's likely to have sex anyway with or without contraception. The girl can come on her own. She doesn't have to come any more than once. She can come with a friend, a relative. She might come with her boyfriend. Um, she doesn't need to come for more than one appointment. Um, you must be satisfied that the parent or guardian is aware. Nope, you don't have to be satisfied that the parent or guardian is aware. You must make some effort to encourage them to tell someone, um, a parent or guardian, just so they have an adult they can talk to. But that's not a, a prerequisite for providing contraception. And in terms of her partner being the same age as her, um, it's important to ask about the age of the partner. Um, is he over the age of 16? Is he much older? Is there child protection issues there? But actually, it, you don't have to ask about the age um, we, we obviously would be worried if, if this 15 year old was having sex with someone much, much older than her. But the scenario says that she's, she's sexually active with her boyfriend of the same age. So we're not too worried about safeguarding there. So the correct answer there is C, that she's likely to have uh, sex anyway, whether or not we give her contraceptive advice. And yeah, in this in this scenario, we are assuming that the, the boyfriend is the same age. Uh, but yeah, we would we would ask her that. So moving on to the last question, and the last question is a um, emergency scenario. This is a scenario that I encountered as an FY1 when I did a gynecology rotation. So it's a real life scenario. Um, so I'm gonna, it's a bit of a long scenario. So I'm going to give you two minutes to read the question and to submit an answer. And this is the last question of the session.
Wonderful. Thank you for answering. So we've no idea what's going on here. Very mixed answers. So let's just dissect the situation together. Here we have a 45 year old woman. She is one day post op. She sounds like she's had quite a big operation, which sounds like it's been pretty complicated with these multiple adhesions. And her main problems are she's in pain and she can't pee. So in terms of her observation, she's um, a bit tachycardic, she's a bit hypotensive, otherwise temperature, sats, respiratory rate are, are within normal parameters. Looking at her bloods, her haemoglobin's normal, but her white cells, platelets and CRP are elevated and her eusinase are normal. So you will see a lot of post-op bloods and you'll be asked to see people post-op quite commonly as an FY doctor. So thinking about these post-op bloods, it's actually quite normal and expected to have a rise in white cell count, a rise in CRP, just due to the inflammatory response associated with us guddling about in her belly and um, the, the inflammatory response of having a big operation. But, but what's happened here? So... I don't think this is an infection. She's only one day post-op. That's not a likely time frame to develop an infection. In addition, she's got no temperature. Her abdomen is not peritonitic. There's no evidence of pus coming from the wound. There's no evidence of a, a, a um, discharge from the vagina. So I'm, I'm not convinced it's infection, but it is a possibility. Acute kidney injury, that is a common post-op problem. Now, I don't think it's this as her eusinase are normal and you've, with the word nurse has passed a catheter and that's, that's drained a normal colour of urine. So she, she may well have an acute kidney injury, but I think it's less likely since her urine is a normal colour and her eusinase are currently normal. She's also on a huge amount of IV fluids, which, which is going to be protective about the kidney. Intra-abdominal hemorrhage, yep, another common post-op problem. And this could certainly account for her hypertension and her tachycardia. But her haemoglobin is, nor is normal and she's, she's, not pee she's not able to pee, which, which is the more worrying thing here. Ileus, post-op ileus is really common, particularly in big abdominal operations where the bills have been handled, the bills go on strike, they don't move, the patient becomes constipated. This is only one day down the line. So ileus wouldn't be presenting one day down the line. You normally get an ileus a several days down the line. Um, and that would present with having a big distended tummy, not being able to pass stool, not being able to pass flatus. Um, and it wouldn't normally cause tachycardia and hypotension unless it had been, unless it was a complete obstruction or unless it had perforated. So the most likely complication here is a bladder injury. And in this scenario, like I said, it's a real life scenario, it turned out that in the process of this um, co common complex operation, part of her uterus had become adherent to her bladder. And as they prized that away, the surgeons had obviously nicked part of the bladder. So the reason that she couldn't pee is that her urine was free flowing into her abdomen and there wasn't actually much in her bladder to drain. And actually looking into it in a bit more detail here, you can see there is there's a discharge on her wound that's not blood stained. That discharge was actually urine leaking directly out of her abdomen. And her urinaries are normal because her kidneys are functioning fine. It's just that the urine is leaking out of the bladder into her abdomen. And this lady ended up returning to theatre for some complex bladder repair involving the surgeons, the urologists, the gynaecologists. She spent a few days in ITU and she made a full recovery. So that scenario is just to make you think that, yep, all of those things are a possibility, but what is the most likely scenario here? So as an FY doctor, you can you can obviously start antibiotics and things like that, but this doesn't quite fit with, a, with an infection. So I would want to, as an FY doctor, be calling my senior, be calling the gynecologist to review this patient. And they did, they took her straight back to theater for an exploratory um, laparotomy again, basically to perform the repair. So we have covered a lot of a lot of things. Well done for persevering, guys, and thank you so much for contributing. I'm just going to have a wee look at the questions and answers. There are a few wee things that I can answer here. Um, I've got someone asking to explain flexible extended use of the COCP. Let me just bounce back to that um, page. So flexible extended use, that is essentially where the person would take the pill every single day. And if she had bleeding on a day, she would then take a four day break. And that allows the, the bleeding to happen and she can get straight back on the pill. Um, thinking about safeguarding issues, a few people have commented on the worries of this 15 year old having sex with someone older than her. 
I know the scenario does say her boyfriend of the same age. The question here is, would I still prescribe the pill if the boyfriend was older, if the boyfriend was 18, if the boyfriend was 19? Uh, yep, I would. But I would obviously want to be thinking about child protection involvement there. But the worst case scenario here would be for me to refuse to give her the pill. She continues to have sex and she ends up pregnant. So we've then got a safeguarding issue and a pregnancy issue. So yeah, I would still give her contraception even if the man, the boyfriend was older. Um, just checking other questions. Um, asking if we need to have a bleed every three months. Nope, there's no reason to have a bleed every three months. If we're on the combined pill, we can safely take that continuously. There's been some good studies in that showing that there's no increased risk of any endometrial pathology. And dysmenorrhea and endometriosis. So what would we prefer? Would we prefer the combined pill or would we prefer the marina? And both are perfectly valid treatment options for painful periods with endometriosis. So it would be a bit of a conversation with the patient what they would prefer. Some people like to take a pill and don't like the idea of having a coil. Um, on the converse, some people like the idea of having a coil fitted and not having to remember to take a pill. So that is a bit subjective, depending on what the patient's priorities are there, but both are perfectly valid treatment options for endometriosis. Um, thinking about this emergency scenario, so let's just go back to that and have a wee look at that again. So people are querying the high CRP, the high white cell count. So that's actually not unexpected in a post-op patient. Those are simply inflammatory markers. So you can get a very profound rise in white cell count post-operatively without infection, and you can get a profound rise in CRP. A one-off White cell count and CRP is not particularly helpful, but if we maybe took those values over a series of days and we saw the white cell count was rising exponentially, yes, of course, that indicates infection. The white cell count should be starting to decrease after the operation, but it's quite common to, to see a very high white cell count if the bloods are taken straight after the operation. Not peritonitic, so peritonism, that's where the abdomen's more rigid, you can get guarding, you can get rebound tenderness. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have actually felt a peritonitic abdomen, it's quite a scary finding. And lots of things can cause that, so things like bleeding inside, infection, even, even ascites can cause quite a, a peritonitic abdomen. But um, she, she might well have peritonism due to the urine, but in this case she doesn't. So a peritonitic abdomen may well indicate infection, it may well indicate bleeding. Um, going back to PMS, so we had a, the lady there that was suffering from premenstrual syndrome, and the question is, why do we prescribe the COCP without a pill-free interval? The reason being there is the, the most effective way of stopping ovulation is to take the pill continuously. Every time you stop taking the pill for a pill-free interval, ovulation may occur. So we want to take it continuously to avoid huge fluctuations in hormones that can contribute to those mood changes. Grand. Um, last question there is how do we differentiate between an ectropion and a dysplasia or a cancer? What I would recommend there is to look at lots and lots of pictures. So an ectropion is quite flat. It's like a little kind of reddish pink halo all around the os. Dysplasia cancers, they tend to be off to one side. They tend to be more lumpy. They tend to be just more abnormal looking. What I would recommend to do in terms of revision is to look at lots and lots of pictures of ectropians and cancers so that you're confident you know the difference between the two. And as an FY doctor, if you are not sure if the cervix looks remotely odd, ask someone else to look at it. Don't just write it off as an ectropian, ask someone else to look at it as well. Perfect. So I've answered all the questions I'm going to answer just now. Um, there is a wee feedback form in the chat box. We would really appreciate you to fill that out. Um, I believe there's a bit of a competition going on to win a free month of QuizMed membership. So take five minutes to pop that, uh, pop your feedback in there. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, it's been a pleasure lecturing and hope to see you at a future QuizMed lecture.